bringing the people behind our food to life. This is Betty Lou. We got her in early April, so she hasn't even started laying yet. She's just a baby. She's probably about to, because she does the freeze with the wings spread, but she's not there yet. We bought our house 16 years ago. Okay, back you go. We didn't set out to create a backyard like this, but when we moved in, it was four trees and some bearded iris over there, and the rest of it was wide open and flat. And it was this time of year, and it was dead grass or dormant grass, and there was an old picnic table back here. Um, and so we've just slowly over the years, I've just added more and more. The chickens came in about four or five years into the process. The bees were five years after that. It just kind of grows on you. But it started off with just two beds and a couple of buckets of tomatoes. So the bigger ones we dry and the little ones we eat. Um, there's a plant called a long keeper. They're over here. And you'll pick them kind of pinkish in late September, um, put them in the basement, they will ripen slowly and you will have fresh, ripe, tasty tomatoes as long as they last, like into February. You've had tomatoes into February for salads. So the lawn keepers are really quite lovely. Our hope was to become a little bit more self-reliant, um, to grow more of our own food, to sort of lessen our impact on the, on, the glo sort of on the global food system. So this house is sort of the central core, if you think in terms of permaculture zones. You've got your, what you have that you use most often closest to your house, and then you work your way out. So in a true permaculture landscape, right around your house are your lettuces and your herbs, and then you work your way back your fruit trees in the backyard and then you work your way out beyond your backyard. Most of the time in the summer all of our greens and everything come from here and then stuff that I'm canning comes from a farm that I work on and then when school starts for a couple of months, I'm not very good with fall crops, um, we will get a CSA. So the goal is to eat locally local produce year-round. Because the soil fertility is so strong, because of all the work that I've been doing on it, um, I plant really close together. So we will get, or we have in the past, about 100 pounds of potatoes out of the three beds. There's another one. Yeah, so we're pretty, we are potato independent. For us locally, I divided it up, because I'm kind of that way, into like backyard within 10 miles, and then I go out to 100 miles. And I think if it's raised within 100 miles, then it's local. If you're getting soybeans from China and processing them in Eugene, I don't consider that a local food. I mean, it won't not eat it, but I don't, I think, I don't think that's local. I think it needs to be grown within about 100 miles of here. So this is where, where the potatoes will live come winter. It's a really stable, cool temperature because it's underground and surrounded on three sides with cement. So um, the eating apples that just came off the Macintosh tree in the front, um, there, they will be down here. I took the really nasty ones and made them into applesauce and a little bit of apple juice, which we're just drinking, and I have some dried. And so these are the ones that should keep for a while. More of them will get dried, probably. I'll be like, okay, I need to put another round through. But they'll stay down here where it's fairly cool for um, probably until November. We'll have them all eaten. And then all the canned stuff lives over here. So, so it all... It's been a good cucumber year. There's bread and butters, there's dilly beans, there's quartz, 
um, a dill and quartz, zenf gherkin. Um, I was experimenting. Pickled beets. Um, these are blueberries, a lot of dried. Cherries. The, the roasted tomato project, which we need about 60 of them to get through the winter. Um, there's some tomato jam, all the dried apples. There's zucchini. If I get a big one, I dry it. And the applesauce. We don't need any more applesauce. That's why I'm June juice. This is grape juice and some experimental cherry juice. And what about the juice, the um, grape juice? The grape juice. This is Mark's mother's technique. Um, and I actually altered it a little bit. You take the grapes. We've got a, a sort of a wild grape. And it's like a cup of grapes and a third a cup of sugar, maybe a quarter cup. Yeah, I think I've gone down to a quarter. She was half and half. Um, it was an old recipe. And then you fill it up with boiling water, and then you just can it for like 10 minutes so that it seals. Grape juice. Yeah, this, and it's actually, it's quite yummy. It's kind of mild. Uh -huh. yeah. And then you feed the, the, the grapes to the chickens. This is the um, wheat that we get from the Fill Your Pantry in November. I'll buy 50 pounds of wheat berries. And what do you do with it? I grind. I have a wheat. Gr I have a grinder that fits on my KitchenAid, and so I grind it, and we, it's basically our wheat for the winter, or for the year. It was part of our whole discussion on what we could do for about peak oil and climate change. I mean, I know that my growing vegetables is not going to really save the planet, but I do believe that we can go gracefully into a, a society that uses less, a lot less oil, or we can go kicking and screaming. And I feel like learning to eat vegetables that are in season and sort of modeling that way of eating um, allows people to think of ways to go more gracefully. And it's not like we don't eat bananas and occasional mangoes and things like that, citrus. We're not, we're far from perfect, but we've shifted the balance so that we're eating a lot more from here and a lot less from there. And people notice. And I'm hoping eventually they'll think, dang, I can do that too. I mean, we've done a lot of other things as well in terms of making our home more energy efficient and using less, but this is probably the prettiest one. Garden oh. of Eden. Yeah, we like it. <laughs>